Welcome to the Cleansing Word Podcast with Pastor John of Calvary Chapel, Lake Villa. Join us as we go through the Bible as we encourage your walk with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more about Calvary Chapel, Lake Villa, visit us at cclv.org. And please share and subscribe to this podcast. Now let's hear a message from God's Word. All right. Well, I titled today's message, Truth or Consequences. And uh, not really big into the game shows, but I even knew about this game show, even though via radio, it began about 20 years before I was born on NBC radio. Truth and Consequences was a game show that was hosted by Ralph Edwards that came to television in 1950. And for a while, Ralph Edwards did both the radio and the TV version of this game show. A couple of the more famous host that followed Ralph Edwards was Bob Barker. A lot of people know that name and also Bob Hilton, and there were several others. But the show itself gave contestants a chance of like two seconds to answer a question. And the question was built in layers. And so truth or consequences, and they were basically entrapping them that they would get to the consequences. Well, that was some wacky stunt that they would have to do if they answered incorrectly. And if they could not complete the truth portion of the game show, then they were stuck with the consequences. And today we find the Sadducees and also a scribe from the sect of the Pharisees asking Jesus regarding the truth of God's word. But we know that the Sadducees did not believe even the question that they were asking, and I'll explain why we know that they did not believe the question that they were asking. And the scribe himself, it is given to us in two different accounts from Mark to Matthew's gospel. And from Mark's gospel, we would think that this guy maybe had a legitimate question, but Matthew tells us that he came testing Jesus. But because they were not willing to face the truth of God's word, the truth of God's Messiah, their Savior, Jesus Christ, one day, unless their heart condition changed, and they would have to face the consequences of those decisions. And so I think it's a very proper title that not only is applicable to what we're reading about from Scripture today, but can be applied to our own lives today. Those who are unwilling to heed the truth of God's word will one day have to face the consequences of their unbelief. So we've been going through the chronological journey through the Gospels, and this is our 79th lesson. We've been working our way since 2022 through the four Gospels and trying to mesh them together as they fall in order. It brings us to the final week of Jesus, and we are probably sitting on that Tuesday of that final week where Jesus did a lot of ministry there in the temple. And I not only titled this Lesson 79, Truth or Consequences, but our first point One Bride for Seven Brothers. If people are into musicals, they'll know where I got that title from. The first commandment of all, and looking at the Christ, a question that Jesus had for his enemies there. So let's go ahead and get into one bride for seven brothers. And this is the Sadducees, and they come to Jesus with an insincere question. And this is what they asked. And it tells us in verses 27 through 33, that some of the Sadducees who denied that there is a resurrection came to him and asked, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife, and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up an offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. And the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her as wife, and he died childless. Then the third took her, and in the like manner, the seven also 
And they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. So you don't even have to be a theologian to understand how insincere this question was because we are told right off the bat by Luke that they did not believe in the resurrection, but they're asking a question about the resurrection. Lord, we have no faith, no belief in life after this life, but we want to ask you a question about life after this life. So right off the get-go, we know it's an insincere question. The Sadducees, their name actually meant the righteous ones or to be righteous. And they only held to the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, and not to any of the oral traditions, the Mishnah or the other oral laws. So they only considered the five books of Moses as the word. But even the five books of Moses talked about God and the resurrection. So I don't know why they did not believe in the resurrection. But further, as a group, they believed that whether good or evil, that they controlled their own lives and that God had no say over our lives. And yet it's what they did not believe that shows us that their question was insincere. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in angels, did not believe in spirits. And they believed that a soul died with the body. And so no life ever after. Still, they concocted this question based on the probability of having life ever after. Now, they were talking about a lover at marriage, and it, it comes not from the Levi's, but from a Latin word that means lever, and it means the husband of a brother. And it is given to us in Deuteronomy 25, 5 and 6. So what they're asking about in this lever at marriage was based on the law of Moses. If a brother dwells together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger. But her brother's brother, her husband's brother, shall go into her, take her as a wife, perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of the dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out in Israel. And so that's the basis of the law. Um, and I know that, you know, we would probably have great difficulties. Um, I don't have a brother, so for Lily and I, this would have never been an issue. So... Sorry, Lily, my brother died, and they didn't have any kids, so got to take another wife. Um, so that wasn't an issue in our family, but I, I'm sure it caused problems. And in fact, we know that in the account of Ruth and Boaz, that this was a lover at marriage, that Ruth's uh, husband had died, and Boaz was in line as a kinsman redeemer, but he wasn't first in line. And he was willing to set aside his role. I mean, Ruth offered herself to be, that he would be her redeemer, but he said there's somebody else in line first. So he made sure that that issue was kind of settled with. And we know in the account of Ruth that the guy who was first in line, who did not redeem Ruth, was worried about his family's inheritance. He didn't want the complication. He wanted the land that would have came as a result of marrying her, but he didn't want the complication. And you can just imagine the complication of, oh, by the way, I'm marrying uh, my sister-in-law. That's not going to work out. Another one was Judah and Tamar. And this one follows kind of close to what was going on here, but Judah had three sons, and he chose, when it was time for Ur, his firstborn son, to have a wife, he chose Tamar to be the wife of his son. So I have to think if a father and a mother are choosing, as they do, as their custom, uh, when Pastor Abraham was living from India, they had the custom of choosing a wife for their children. And, and he was here, when he came to the States from India, he was often on the hunt for uh, a husband for his daughter, and he found one in California. And so he found somebody from the States eventually. 
but I'd asked him, I said, all right, you guys do the choosing. Does your children have any say whatsoever? And he goes, yeah, we do. In our custom, we give them one opportunity to meet and they'll spend maybe an hour together, who knows how long. And after that first initial meeting, it's either a yay or nay. If it's a nay, they move on to someone else. If it's a yay, they'll continue the process. So imagine that for dating. You get one shot, yes or no. But think about that for Judah. He's picking a woman to be his son's wife. And so I have to think that she had some qualities about her. And it wasn't Tamar that was the issue. In fact, the word tells us that after they were married, that Ur did some untold wickedness. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 38, 7, that the Lord killed him. And so having no successor, Judah instructed Onan. He said, 38, 8, go into your brother's wife, marry her, raise up an heir to your brother. And so they're doing this leveret marriage. He said, go. Except Onan, he deceived everyone. He made it look like that he was actually trying to get Tamar pregnant, but he made sure that he wasn't getting her pregnant. And so however that works, you can read about it in scripture. But it said God was displeased with him also, and he died as well. And so Shelah was the last son of Judah, and he was younger, and so he told, Judah told Tamar, he's too young right now, and so when he's older, we'll make sure that you get married and you can have your offspring, have your son. But I think Judah was thinking by this time, you know, I thought Tamar was a good girl, but my sons are dying off quicker than left and right here, and um, he didn't want his youngest son, his only son, remaining to marry Tamar. So he withheld his son from her. Over the course of time, Judah's wife died. Tamar took off her widow's garment, put on a garment of a prostitute, and was able to trick her father-in-law into having sex with her that she became pregnant. Once it was discovered, he was ready to kill her, but she was a smart girl. She had taken his signet ring taken his staff and she said send word back to Judah the man who got me pregnant these things belong to him and Judah said she is more righteous than I because I withheld my son from her and the Bible tells us that he never had sexual relations with her again but she had twin sons born to her the youngest of the twins was Perez and he is in the lineage of Christ which is amazing pretty bizarre story all has to do with this leveret marriage and uh, ends up being in part of the lineage of Christ that we can read about and truly this was a bizarre situation Romans 8 28 tells us all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes God can even make the most bizarre circumstances sometimes work out for good for the glory of God so that was their scenario that they had concocted. One bride for seven brothers. And in the end, when they went to heaven, which the Sadducees didn't even believe existed, whose wife would she be? Jesus' answer in verses 34 through 38, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are accounted worthy to obtain that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry or are given in marriage, nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So here, I think Jesus is pointing out to the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. But they did believe in the first five books of the Bible, which were traditionally penned by Moses. Jesus says, even Moses shows us 
that God is not the God of the dead, but he is the God of the living. As he said, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Wasn't talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in past tense, but in present tense. As they died, they were in the presence of the Lord. So Jesus said that their logic was mistaken because they did not know scriptures nor the power of God. In heaven, things will not be as they are on the earth. We're in heaven, we'll be likened to the angels. It doesn't mean that we will become angels, but we will, like the angels, be continually living in the presence of God. Unlike angels, we will be the eternal bride of Christ, the sons of righteousness, as Jesus described it, the sons of the resurrection, as Jesus described it in verse 37. We will be the eternal bride of Christ, which is why God addressed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as still living. I am the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, Exodus 3, 6. God said to Moses there at the burning bush. And seeing that God is always the God of the living, it's important for us to make sure that we find that pathway to life. In John 11, 25 and 26, Thomas had asked the way, and Jesus responding to him saying, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man can come to the Father except by me. The pathway to life comes through Jesus. The Sadducees were given the truth of God's word, but they misinterpreted the scriptures. They had a misunderstanding of the kingdom of God and their belief system causing them to believe that there was no resurrection, no angels, no spirits, no immortality of the soul. If they would continue in that belief system, they would one day have to face the consequences of their belief and that consequences would be the coming judgment of God. So I believe it would be wise to place your faith in God, the God of the living. When we go over to Mark's gospel, we discover another question being asked to Jesus. This one comes from a scribe, and in Matthew's gospel, we learn that he is from the sect of the Pharisees. And so we have the Sadducees, the Pharisees. This is a scribe. It's a legal term. He was one who wrote law, uh, could have been a copy, copyist of the Word of God, but he was someone who was accustomed to writing law. And so one of the scribes came, and having heard them reason together, perceived that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? So Mark 12, verse 28, a scribe comes, testing Jesus, asking, which is the first commandment of all? So we need to remember that not all the religious rulers of Jesus' day were opposed to Christ. Many were legitimately searching for the coming Messiah. Like Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3, verse 2, he said to Jesus, Rabbi, you, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do the things that you do. So there were some who were legitimately searching for the things of God. And here a Pharisee, a scribe of the sect of the Pharisees, came and inquired of Jesus about the first commandment of all. Now Matthew tells us in Matthew 22, 35, saying that he came testing Jesus. So if it wasn't for Matthew and Jesus' response to this man in Mark's gospel, saying that you are close to the kingdom of God, it seems that it was somewhat legitimate. And maybe it was a test. Maybe he truly wanted to know. Maybe both are true. But he was testing. And in the Greek, this often means in a good sense, he was testing the character, trying to understand a view, the character of something, 
but it could also be used in a bad sense of the sense that he was trying to trap Jesus. And for the most part, that's what was happening with the religious rulers during that final week. They were trying to entrap Jesus. Now, Israel's religious rulers had categorized the law into 613 commandments. We struggle with the Ten Commandments, saying, Lord, how can we keep all ten of these? And the Jews thought, well, how can we really know and understand the ten? We need to kind of break these down. And so they, they broke them down. They broke them down. They had the thou shall nots, 365 shall nots. For every day of the year, you had a shall not when you got up in the morning. You shall not. What's my shall not for today? And they had 248 thou shalls. They had so many laws that I... I've mentioned this from the pulpit several times. I'm sure it's only getting worse, but years ago I read that every one of us commit at least three felonies a day because in the United States there are so many laws that we have no clue what the laws are, and all they do is keep adding more laws to the laws that we already have. And so if they want to find you guilty, they'll find something on you. Maybe that's why they have so many laws that they can make us appear guilty for doing things that... Maybe we're not so guilty about. But they tried to narrow it down. What's the most important? What's the first? It reminded me of the seven cardinal sins that are very familiar in the Catholic Church, but the deadly sins that are lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, pride, to stay away from these seven, well, no doubt would be a good thing. But Jesus responded to his question. Whether legitimate or not, Jesus responded and said in verse 29, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. So the hero Israel, Shema, in the Greek, Shema Israel, so hero Israel, it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And Shema means to hear. And this is to be prayed twice a day for the faithful Jews. It's considered one of the most important texts of the Old Testament, and it is required to be the first memory verse of Jewish children. As soon as they're able to memorize anything, they teach them the Shema. And this prayer was given to Moses as a declaration of Israel's monotheistic faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So monotheism, it's the belief that there is one God, as in Judaism, as in Christianity, as in Islam. In Christianity, we believe that there is one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In Islam, they believe in their one God, but it's the wrong God. He is not the same God of the Bible. And of course, Judaism, it is Yahweh of the Old Testament. But we also see that um, throughout the Old Testament that he's prophesying of his son, of the Messiah, and of God the Holy Spirit. So uh, we are very good in our position and our belief in the church. We believe in one God, God who is revealed to us in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But in the Shema itself, we have three different times God being mentioned. The first is Yahweh. Uh, the, in the New King James, in the King James Bible, they always distinguish the YHWH by all capital letters. And so capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It always stands for Yahweh. If you have a translation that does that, very helpful to distinguish uh, what's being said there, the name that's being given there. And this is the name that God revealed to Moses. But sadly, Israel didn't want to take the Lord God's name in vain, and so they never spoke it and never wrote it out completely. So they never wrote in the vowel sounds. So all we have is the consonants. 
and the YHWH is what we have. So Jehovah, Yahweh, it has been uh, revealed that way. But that name given to Moses in Exodus 3, 13 and 14. So the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord God, Elohim, it's the plural of God. And so El would be the singular form. And so this is Elohim. And it is uh, plural intensive in the sense that it is a plural intensive that takes on singular meaning. And so leaving room for the three in one. And then we have Yahweh being repeated again. The Lord God, the Lord is one. And so Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh is one. Ikad is the Hebrew word for one. And that is a word that can be translated two or more as one. It's the same word that when Adam and Eve are married in the garden, and it tells us the two became one flesh. Ikad is the Hebrew word for that. In Genesis 2.24, the two becoming one flesh. And perhaps another clue in the triunity of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one. And so first, he gave them the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Second, he said, verse 5, Deuteronomy 6, 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now, Jesus added mind in there. And so he added one extra word in there. But how we are to love God with our whole being. And love in the Hebrew, it, it speaks about to desire or to breathe after. And it's much like our English word for love. It can have a variety of meaning. It can speak about loving one another, loving a friend or a family member. Uh, it can be either a platonic love or a sensual love. Agapeo or agape is the Greek word for love. And it is a love from how I understand it, a love that always gives without not expecting anything in return. And it describes the way by which we are to love God and how God has loved us. The Godhead, God the Father loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. God the Son loved us so much that he's willing to come and to offer his life as a sacrifice for our sin. And God the Holy Spirit loves us so much that he makes his dwelling in us and pours out the love of God into our hearts. And so how are we to show this type of love to the Lord, you are to love the Lord your God? Well, 1 John 5, 2 and 3 tells us, by this we know we love the children of God and that we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. How interesting, the scribe came to Jesus and said, which is the first of all the commandments? What's the most important one that we are to keep? And Jesus said, the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart. So, huh, I said that wrong. Let's get back to that. The beginning of the Shema is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then he went on to say, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And so how do we do that? Through keeping God's law. And John tells us they're not burdensome. Jesus not only said that we are to love God, but went on to describe the totality of love in which we are to love him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the heart, in the Greek, it refers to the center of our circulation. Of course, we understand what the human heart muscle is, but it's, for the Greeks, it was considered the seat of their emotion and the seat of all physical and spiritual life. And so again, it, it speaks of a love that wells up from the deepest regions of our being, the soul referring to that which becomes a living being, but the breath of the spirit that was breathed into us in Genesis 2, 7. It speaks about that immaterial part, the immortal part of humanity, that soul or spirit, we could describe it, that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our soul, speaks about that love that comes from the immaterial part of our being 
The mind speaks about the intellect that we have, the feelings, the affections that we can have, our faith, our love in God that is strengthened by our learning and our understanding of who God is and what he has done for us. And the might speaks about the physical strength, the force that which we can have by the means that we are able to, um, through mental or physical power, Show that strength of love that we have toward the Lord God. Not because we're forced to, but because we love him. We love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, with all of our soul. And then Jesus added a bonus. He said, the second is like it. You shall love the neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So Jesus added a bonus but he got it from the Old Testament, from Leviticus 19, 17, and 18, where in the law of Moses it says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is what James called the royal law in James 2.8, where he says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. And yet, how are we to love our neighbor? Well, Jesus said, as yourself. How do you love yourself? I can tell you that I've never, whether you guys are here or not, I've never come to church and I... I'm here quite a bit. <laughs> I always brush my teeth before I come. I may not meet anybody. It may just be me in the building alone with God. I always comb my hair. I even did this as a bricklayer. I had a laborer once make comments. He's like, you always look so groomed in the morning. It's like, not very hard. <laughs> All you got to do is brush your teeth, comb your hair. I'm sure I learned that from my parents. <laughs> but take care of yourself. Ephesians 5, 29, no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it. Just as the Lord does his church. So as we care for ourselves, we are to care for others. So the scribe responded to Jesus, said, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no other but He, and to love Him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one neighbors as yourself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now Jesus saw that He answered wisely, and He said, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared, to answer, um, dared question Him. So this stopped the questions again. But this man, he understood the truth that Jesus spoke. And Jesus responded and said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But he did not say that he was part of the kingdom of God. I believe this is an issue with so many in our world today, that there are many who are not far from the kingdom of God. They're close, and it caused me this morning to think about and we'll get into this uh, when we get to, we're in the Old Testament now in the book of Judges, and we'll move from Judges to Ruth, the first and second Samuel, and in first Samuel, um, we'll learn of Abner being killed by Joab right outside the gates of the city of refuge. The city of refuge was a place where if someone had committed murder and Abner did not commit murder, but he had killed Joab's brother in battle, and Joab held a grudge against Abner. And uh, he deceived him right outside the city of refuge, right outside the gates of where Abner could have gained refuge from Joab. There could have been a trial. There could have been a proper proceeding to see if Abner was actually guilty or not. But he was killed outside the gates of the city of refuge of Hebron. And yet all he had to do was enter into those gates and cry out, and his life could have been spared. 
And I believe in our world today that there are many who are just outside the kingdom of God. They're close. They have an understanding of Scripture. They know the truth of the Word of God concerning God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that Jesus made upon the cross, but they have never personally ask the Lord to forgive them of their sin, to receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And though this scribe perceived the truth of Jesus' answer, unless he received the salvation that was made available through faith in Jesus Christ, he would one day have to face the consequences of his choice, his unbelief, and the state of so many in our world today. You can have knowledge of the letter of the law and the scribes. They knew the letter of the law. But it doesn't mean that you enter in. On the other hand, those who love the Lord God with all their heart, with all their soul, all their mind and strength, and love their neighbors as their self, should have no problem walking in the commandments of God. And have you entered into the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ? Oh, it is my hope that you have. And finally, Jesus is the one who poses the question, verses 41 through 46. And he speaks about the Christ here. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. So the Pharisees now are asked a question by Jesus about the Christ, whose son is he? And they responded correctly. He is the son of David. So the Christ is Christos in the Greek. Mashiach would be the Hebrew term for this in the um, Old Testament portion of our Bible. They both mean the same thing, the anointed one. Who is the anointed one? And they said, he is the son of David. Now, in the Old Testament, those who were anointed often were the prophets, the priests, the kings. But here it is symbolizing the Messiah, the coming Messiah. So Jesus in the Hebrew could have asked this. It's written to us here in Mark's gospel in the Greek using Christos, but it could have been um, the Hebrew term of Messiah, Mashiach. But they mean the same thing. Only of the 39 times the Mashiach is recorded in the Old Testament only twice. Is it recorded as Messiah? And it's in Daniel 9, verses 25 and 26. And we know this prophecy of the end times where it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and tell Messiah the prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62 weeks And the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. Daniel 9, 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it will be with a flood till the end of the war of desolations are determined. So the Hebrew word used 39 times in the Old Testament, only twice In the New King James, I have to put it that way. It means the anointed. Twice in the New King James, they translate it as Messiah. And um, Christos, it's translated as Messiah as well. In the New Testament, where John, in John 1, 41... In John 4, 25, Andrew found his brother Simon. We know him as Peter best. He said, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And so there they give us the both terms being given there, Messiah and Christ, the same, and the woman at the well. John 4, 25, the woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. And then John put in parentheses, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So speaking about the son of David, Ezekiel 34, 23 through 24, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my son David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. In verse 24, 
and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken this. So they answered correctly. But then Jesus gave them an enigma of scripture. It comes from Psalm 110, verse 1, which is, by the way, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, where he said, How does David, in the Spirit, call him Lord? Where he says, quoting from Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare question him anymore. And so we have Jesus just entrapping them. It's like this is the most popular uh, quoted psalm in the New Testament. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord. And again, we have the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand, which is a place of honor, until I give you authority and make your enemies, the Messiah's enemies, the Messiah's footstool. So to bring them under subjugation. So Jesus asked, how does David call him? If he's the son of David, how does David then call the Messiah the Lord? And in Revelation 22, 16, we get a hint of this, where Jesus said, I, Jesus, am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. I am the root, but I'm also the offspring. I'm on both sides of the history of David. I am the root, I am also the offspring. It speaks about the root, the divine nature of Jesus Christ. But the offspring speaks about that human nature, that he was both God and man, both divine and flesh. So after presenting this enigma of Scripture and pointing out the eternal nature of the Christ as the son of David, no one dared ask him any other questions at that point. And though the Pharisees came closer to having a right relationship or understanding of Scripture, uh, the Pharisees, 400 years before the time of Christ, they were the back-to-Bible guys. As Calvary Chapel people, we would have liked them. They liked to stick to the Word of God. They liked to know what the Word of God said. But after 400 years, they got far from the truth of God's Word. Their unwillingness to answer Jesus' questions showed that they were actually far from the truth. And to stay in this state would mean that they would too one day have to face the consequences of their unbelief. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And then in verse 36, Jesus said, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And have you allowed the truth of Christ to set you free? I hope that you have. Every day we make cho choices. But there is no more important choice to make in our lives than determining whether we believe in Christ or not. We can hear the truth, but it doesn't mean that we will obey the truth or walk in truth. But those who respond in faith in Jesus Christ will be able to walk as sons and daughters of the Lord in the heavenly realm. We'll be like those angels. Maybe heaven won't quite picture, and the Bible is not very clear exactly what heaven will be like, even this, of asking about marriage. And I'm sure we have often thought about these things. And Jesus said, you guys don't understand, nor do you know the power of God. But the important thing is to come into that relationship with Christ that will keep us from facing the consequences of judgment. And Father, we thank you for your word that you've given us here this morning, and we're so grateful, Lord, of the truth of your word. Yes, there, your word is truth. And how we respond to that truth is so important. 
those, Lord, who respond to your truth through receiving Jesus as their Savior, Lord, will not have to face the consequences of their sin at a future time when the judgment comes. But Lord, there are many who have heard the truth of your word and they reject Jesus. And those who continue in that rejection will one day have to face the consequences of their rejection. I pray, Lord, that no one hearing my voice today will ever have to face those consequences. May they come to your truth. And the word tells us, Lord, you are truth. We thank you, Lord, for this morning, for this message. Bless us now, Lord, as we close out in a time of worship and waiting upon you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.